so today I'll be talking about disorientation and the top-down nature of self-location. So I'll be looking at some of the discussions in philosophy about self-location uh, in the light of recent neuroscientific findings. And also I'll be discussing uh, disorientation and how disorientation can give us some insight into self-location and environmental experience. And I think as um, was already mentioned, I'm part of Institut Jean Nico, which is in the Department of Cognitive Science of École Normale Supérieure, and also part of EHSS and NS and CNRS. The, a lot of a lot of acronyms, as is the uh, the case often in France. And within Institut Jean Nico, I'm working under the supervision of Roberto Casati. Um, who leads the disorientation group. Uh, so hence my, my interest in disorientation. And then I'm also affiliated uh, at the Institute of Behavioral Neuroscience, uh, the Spears Lab, uh, which specializes in spatial cognition in, uh, in London, in UCL. So the, the work I'll be, I'll be presenting here uh, has to do with some of my research on disorientation and also with um, self-location, which was the topic of the short paper I submitted to the to the prize. But of course, the, it was a fairly short paper, so it will then, it will then be enough by itself for, for a long uh, talk. So this is the outline, so you have an idea of what's coming ahead. I will start from the claim that's, um, I think, of course, with uh, a lot of our uh, folk intuitions and that it's, uh, I think, the kind of a standard view in philosophy right now that perceptual experience is self-locating. Then I look at some problems with perspectival accounts, which argue that perceptual experience is self-locating in virtue of the perspective of our perceptual experience. And instead of that view, I'll defend what I call the strong uh, self-location thesis. And then I'll discuss cognitive maps and other centric frames of reference and look at recent uh, neuroscientific evidence on something that's called spatial modulation uh, to argue for this thesis. Uh, and then I'll look at also disorientation and vertigo of direction. And finally, I'll do some phenomenological analysis looking at how cognitive maps might be reflected in the horizon of intentionality. So, First, perceptual experience is self-located in. Um, the idea is fairly straightforward. Is if you, I don't know, wake up and you are in this room, you will know that you are in Paris because you are located, in, you, you see where the Eiffel Tower is. You also see that there is some flowers to your left, a carpet below you, some pyjamas, uh, some suitcases, that a bit farther away there is a table uh, with some breakfast. and. The idea is that you don't need to do any explicit inference. You can just yes, look around you and you will know where you are located with respect to this object. So it is that self-location um, can already happen in virtue of uh, perceptual experience. So this is the common sense view in the sense that whenever you talk about self-location to anybody who has not heard about the topic before, or especially someone who is not a philosopher, um, they will, my, my experience is that they will tend to, tend to think that this is the case, that they just need to look around to know where they are. And it's also the dominant view in philosophy. Uh, so here, for example, Brewer says that perception places us in the perceived world. And Kwasim Kassam describes perceptual experience as self-locating. In experiencing objects as spatially related to one, one literally experiences the bodily selves as located in the perceived world. And the way Christopher Peacock puts it, the everyday case in which a person forms a belief with the content, I am in front of a door, and that's so for the reason that he sees a door ahead of him, his visual experience represents him as bearing a certain spatial relation to the door. Taking his experience at face value, he will judge that he's in front of the door. Uh, so this is another way of thinking about it, is that self-locating judgments that we can make simply by taking visual experience at face value. Now, a way that a lot of people explain this self-locating aspect of perspect 
of uh, perceptual experience is by uh, looking at per, uh, at perspectival aspects of perceptual experience. So there is a certain perspective when we look at any space. There there are things like occlusion, things that are far from us uh, look smaller, things that are closer to us look relatively bigger, and the idea is that simply in virtue of its perspectival character, visual experience can include the location of the perceiver among its face value contents. So here, the idea is that the moment you have something like perspective, then you'll have a self-locating perceptual experience. And actually, very often, that the two go together, that uh, perceptual experience being self-locating and that being in virtue of perspective is sometimes even just assumed by some philosophers or Avila here is explicit but goes as far uh, as far as claiming that the perspectival and the self-locating characters of perceptual experience are different sides of the same coin. The fact that we experience objects as standing in egocentric spatial relationships with respect to ourselves, perspectival character, has a correlate in the fact that by experiencing objects in that way, our spatial relation with those objects is automatically specified to self-locating character. So you hopefully get an idea of what these perspectival accounts are. And now I'll present four arguments against perspectival accounts. Um, some already have appeared in the literature in different forms, and some are new to this, uh, to this talk or uh, to, this, to this paper. Um, the first argument against perspectival account is that photographs have perspectival structure but are not self-locating. So it's something discussed in Cohen and Meskin in 2004. And the same is true for um, videos, uh, for some other pictures, even for some imagined objects. There, there is a similar argument that uh, Al Smith, uh, Adrian Al Smith, uh, discusses. Uh, with imaginary objects that we can imagine from different perspectives and that doesn't change our sense of where we are located with respect to that, to that object. So the idea is fairly straightforward. Uh, pictures, something like photographs, have a perspective, but they are not self-locating. If you take a photograph and you move around, your location is changing, the perspective is not changing. Um, and of course, as one can imagine, there could be a lot of counter arguments depending on how one understands the nature of photographs um, and how one understands the nature of the perception of photographs. Now a different argument that might be more convincing is that we don't experience ourselves as either multiply located nor as located as the single point of origin of the perspectival structure. So something like vision seems to have like an origin or a source but that's not where we experience ourselves as located. Uh, the way Briscoe puts it is that there is no privileged point in or on my body that counts as me for purposes of characterizing my perceived spatial relation to the object. So the idea is that we don't tend to experience ourselves as located the way this uh, picture will have it, as being this, this kind of um, point in a space. Uh, and that's what Gould if self-location is really, really down to just perspective, um, that's what could seem to follow. Um, and of course, one, one could have some more complicated accounts, some more elaborated account on how this perspective then gets integrated with body schemas. Um, but you then run into the problem of you lose a bit of the a original attraction of the view that it is all down to perspective. It seems like you need to add extra ingredients to the to the perspectival account. Now the third argument against perspectival account is that first person perspective and body location can actually come apart under experimental conditions and in out of body experiences. Um, so there's this series of uh, now pretty famous experiments right in virtual reality. Uh, they're a bit like a full body extension of the rubber hand illusion. Um, so this is from Langenhager and colleagues and similar experiments by, it's also a work by Olaf Blanke and uh, Metzinger. 
uh, that's probably the, the most famous one. And the idea is that there's a virtual body that's located in front of the participant who is wearing the virtual reality helmet. And the participant gets stimulated, so gets poked uh, on different parts of the body in synchrony with the virtual own body. And one of the things that happens is that even though there is no change in the perspective, there is a sense of ownership in the ver of the virtual body that actually um, changes the, um, the estimation of self-location, the, the sense of where your own body is in a space or where you are located in a space. So you can see that the perspective can remain the same and by altering different uh, aspects in this case through uh, tactile stimulation, uh, you can get a change in self-location. Um, and then in some other neuropsychological studies, uh, there's a very good review by Barry and Burgess in 2014. Um, we can see that self-motion information is necessary for self-location. So one clear example is if you have a rodent, say a rat, a mouse, and a hamster, and you have them on a rotating platform and you rotate the platform very slightly so that the self-motion cues are not picked up by the mice, uh, then the self-location uh, is affected very strongly. And you can see that based on their um, behavior in dead reckoning or path integration. You can see that the moment you start messing up with some of this self-motion information, uh, self-location is very heavily affected, which again seems to tell you that visual perspective in itself is not enough for self-location. You also need the integration of other cues, uh, in particular self-motion cues, but it might also be things like optic flow or things like even auditory signals sometimes. And still, there is something very attractive about the idea that visual experience can include the location of the perceiver among its face value content. The way Schlenker, Schlenkler puts it, uh, we cannot do justice to our phenomenological intuitions if we insist that self-locating judgments are always drawn only by inference from visual experience whose face value contents are entirely non-self-locating. So the idea is that if we want to do justice to the phenomenological, to our phenomenological intuitions, uh, we need to have a view of perceptual experience as self-locating. So the big question that this uh, contribution tries to answer is how can we do that if not through perspectival accounts and not through um, calling for further integration or further ingredients? And the central claim is that visual experience can include the location of the perceiver among its face value contents, but not in virtue of its perspectival character. Visual experience can include the location of the perceiver among its face value contents in virtue of cognitive maps that modulate visual processing in a top-down fashion. That is what I call the strong self-location thesis. So the idea is that cognitive maps modulate visual processing and this results in the self-locating aspect of perceptual experience. So before I go into um, arguing for the, for the thesis and, for the, and, and bring in more details uh, about the account, uh, I want to clarify how I understand cognitive maps. And here's what uh, Bermudez has to say about cognitive maps. Uh, cognitive maps has been, um, yes, uh, for, for those of you who might not be familiar with this literature, it's a notion first introduced by Tolman based on some rat experiments uh, in the first half of the 20th century. And then the idea um, received uh, neuroscientific support with the discovery of place cells in the hippocampus. And particular, I guess the central book here is the hippocampus as a cognitive map uh, by Okif and, and Nadell. And the idea is that the hippocampus is building some kind of model or representation of the environment. Um, might be the hippocampal and parahippocampal regions also. Um, and 
this there's been like increasing evidence for for something like a cognitive map uh, in the last 30 or 40 years of uh, neuroscientific work and the most sophisticated level of spatial awareness is usually described in terms of possession of a cognitive map one way in which this point is often put is that possession of a cognitive map goes hand in hand with the possibility of identifying places on an environment center allocentric rather than body center egocentric frame of reference so there is something that is the egocentric frame of reference like um, a table is to my right or a door is to my left at a certain distance and then there is something different that's called allocentric frame of reference that Bermudez call, calls environment center and to understand well what cognitive maps are uh, it's good to unpack this notion of allocentric frame of reference so here I, I will use the term allocentric spatial representation uh, to refer to a spatial representations coded in an allocentric frame of reference is just for um, for convenience it's just easier to say it that way um, the idea is that there are multiple ways that the concept of allocentric frames of reference ha has been used in the literature and there are some inconsistencies in the way it's, it has been used uh, in psychology in neuroscience in philosophy and here I understand allocentric spatial representations as non-center structure sets of spatial relations and to illustrate what I mean by non-center I will put this conception of the term allocentric in contrast with Susanna Schellenberg's uh, use of the term and what Schellenberg says is that an allocentric frame of reference is a frame of reference that is centered on a point in space distinct from the one that the perceiver is occupying the information in an allocentric frame of reference is only available to us through a potential egocentric frame of reference so the idea is that the only way uh, that we can make sense of this information is by thinking of this allocentric frame of reference as potential egocentric frames of reference if I imagine the room in which I am in coded in an allocentric frame of reference, that representation will be centered on some point that I could occupy, um, and then it will coincide with an egocentric frame of reference. And so this is the idea, I think, of the potential egocentric frame of reference. But and, and in a way, it makes sense if you look at first egocentric representation and then allocentric representation or frames of reference. As an egocentric representation is centered on the subject, an allocentric representation stands in contrast to this. However, this does not mean that it must be centered on something other than the subject. The confusion lies in the fact that every time we try to imagine a space, we have to imagine it from somewhere. It's very hard to imagine as it were, and a space that's seen from nowhere. Um, and yet this does not entail that spatial representations have to be stored with a particular center, right? It's, it's not necessary that just because egocentric spatial representations have a center, which is the ego or the cells, uh, the same has to be true for allocentric spatial representations. Um, what Schellenberg has in mind might be better described as uh, what as in the literature is called a mock egocentric representation of uh, of a space, uh, which is a term um, that's used by Grush in 2007. Um, I think actually allocentric representations are stored in the brain in a non-centered way. And this, I think, also the, the way that uh, neuroscientific and computational models are going right now. So recent advances in neuroscientific and computational research conceive cognitive maps as structured sets of relations. That these allocentric representations are not centered becomes easier to grasp when we understand that cognitive maps code not only for spatial relations, but also for conceptual or social relations. And here there's some evidence coming from the work by Constantinescu and also Tavares. So the idea is that uh, the areas, the regions that are coding for uh, spatial relations are also coding for 
conceptual relations or social relations in the sense of, for example, social organizations, our, our place within a social hierarchy uh, is coded in a very similar way. So take the following cognitive map of a set of social relations. Uh, William James is the son of Henry James, senior of Albany, uh, who is a famous preacher. Henry James, Jr., who is the writer, is the son of Henry James, Sr. of Albany, and William James, the psychologist, and Henry James, Jr. are brothers. So if you map these three relations, or this set of relations, you get something like this, kind of triangle of bidirectional relations uh, between the three James Jameses. Um, and I think, you know, this set of social relations can be expressed in a graph, but it does not need to have a center, nor does it have to be seen from anywhere in particular. The same applies to structured sets of relations between locations. Um, if, and if you want to see a detailed model of how these cognitive maps store and generalize spatial and non-spatial knowledge, there is a fairly recent paper by Whittington that's uh, very good on the topic. Um, before I go into the arguments, can somebody confirm that uh, I'm still connected? Because I cannot see anybody and I cannot hear anybody. Uh, just to make sure I haven't like lost my connection, I've been talking yes. to myself. Yes, we hear all good. All good. Okay, great. I just um, I have Virgin Media and it's uh, it's been going up and down uh, this last week because they're doing some work, so I'm a bit uh, terrified of my of my internet going going down and and keeping on going for a long time. Thanks. Um, okay, so so hopefully the idea of how cognitive maps work as a kind of set of a space of uh, a structure a spatial relations uh, helps understand what I mean when I say that cognitive maps modulate visual experience in a top-down fashion and what I do in the remainder of the of the talk I will be presenting three arguments to support this this claim the claim that cognitive maps modulate visual experience in a top-down fashion the first one is just looking at neuroscientific evidence that the spatial memory systems shape visual experience. Um, the second one is looking at something that's called vertigo of direction in the literature, or sometimes colloquially is known as being turned around, um, which I argue is the result of allocentric misrepresentation of modulating visual experience. And the third argument is a phenomenological analysis of environmental experience. So looking at the neuroscience, um, there is increasing evidence that the activity of the mouse primary visual cortex is modulated by navigational signals. During navigations, the responses of uh, the neurons in the primary visual cortex are modulated by the animal's estimate of a spatial position. And the underlying spatial signals co-vary with those in hippocampus and are affected similarly by idiothetic cues. So, um, the, the idea is that there are the hippocampal regions that are coding for a space that are, you know, sort of as the house of the cognitive map or the seed of uh, spatial cognition. And it turns out that these regions are actually modulating uh, in a top-down fashion the activity uh, of the primary visual cortex. And to get a better understanding of the repercussions of this uh, discovery, uh, it's good to look at the, I think the, the, pa the paper by Salim and colleagues in 2018. So what they did is they had the mice uh, trained to navigate a labyrinth, which the usual thing in the spatial cognition research, and they made it so that there were two regions with identical visual landmarks. Um, so that without top-down modulation, one will expect visual neurons to respond identically to both regions. And what's really striking is that most of the neurons um, in, the, in the V1 region uh, responded only or more strongly to the landmarks in one of the two regions. So the idea is that the visual experience in two visually identical regions differs and it differs because of the differing allocentric representations of those regions. The activation of, um, of neurons in the visual cortex, in the primary visual cortex, 
is very different for visually identical input. And when you look at uh, the neurons there and the neurons in the hippocampus, you can see modulatory effects that explain this difference. So they were tracking uh, neural populations in V1 and also in the CA1 region of the hippocampus. And using a Bayesian decoder, uh, they could effectively decode position of the animal based on population activity. So just by looking at the hippocampal activity, this Bayesian decoder, decoder was able to tell where the, my, where the mouse was at the time. But more interestingly, just by looking at the V1 region, the Bayesian decoder was able to tell where the mouse was uh, in a space as well, uh, just by looking at the activity um, in the visual regions rather than the hippocampal regions. And even more interesting, I think, is that the position decoded from both these areas was highly correlated, including common errors. So when the hippocampal region got the position wrong, this was reflected in the in the visual region getting the getting the position wrong as well. So the idea is that both regions are representing the same spatial information, and one of them, the the hippocampal region, is modulating the visual the visual region. And then they tried to see if it was coming down to actual spatial location or really to the experience location, the location as experienced by the mouse. And the way they did this is, is quite smart. So they trained the mice to look for a water reward upon reaching a reward zone in the corridor. So they divided the trials into three groups. Uh, early trials in which too many leaks occur before the reward zone and then no reward is given. So they are going down this corridor and uh, there is a place in which they have to leak if they want to get a reward. If they leak too much too early, no reward. Then there are correct trials to which one or more leaks occurred in the reward zone. So they only leaked uh, when they had reached this uh, this stripe, this, this area of the, uh, this stretch of the corridor. And then late trials in which the mouse kept going and missed the reward zone and leaked afterwards. So they passed the reward, the stretch of the corridor where there is the reward zone and then they leaked there. And the probability of being in the reward zone predicted from both CA1 and V1 peaked before the reward zone in early trials and after it in late trials. And this consistent deviation suggests that the representations of position in V1 and CA1 correlate with the animal's decision to leak and thus reflect its subjective estimate of position. In other words, its perceived self-location. So it tells you that it is the activity of the hippocampus that is giving the location to the visual, uh, to the primary visual cortex. So that the way, um, the way that the mouse is able to locate itself is because of the activity of the hippocampus having a top-down modulation on visual regions, right? And this, this I take to be. Um, to be driving towards what I call the top-down self-location thesis, right? So there is, as I said, not only just this experiment, but pretty consistent evidence of spatial modulation, and in in other, I mean, in other aspects of spatial cognition, uh, as you know, as researchers are able to do more and more research on uh, human spatial cognition, uh, they are starting to confirm things. Uh, that were found uh, first in, in rodent spatial cognition. So I think there's good reason to expect that similar effects will be found uh, in, in humans. And also the above experimental work aligns with a broader line of research on top-down effects in visual processing, which have been widely reported in humans. So there seem to be a lot of top-down effects. It's not just about hippocampal activity. So it's not surprising that um, visual processing is modulated um, through the through the self-location as as coded in the hippocampus. And something that you might worry is that they might have trained in this area, so they might have developed a cognitive map because they had been around this labyrinth. Uh, but what happens when you go to a new place? 
you are still able to locate. When I showed you this picture of Paris, um, if you had been in that room, you'll have still have been able to locate uh, with respect to that room. Um, so I think it's very important to note that cognitive maps are not unique to familiar places. It's not like we need to go to a place and then when we're home, we somehow like draw a map in our heads or something like that. These uh, place self firing patterns are very quickly established right after entering a new environment. So the moment one enters a new environment, uh, place cells start firing and start in a way modeling the space that one is entering. And still as one will expect, a spatial modulation grows with experience and is stronger during active behavior than during passive viewing, which I think also makes sense. Now, what about the, the human case and how, how might this um, relate to, to the visual experience in humans and in particular to the self-locating aspect of visual experience? And to, to understand this better, I'll, I'll draw on some of my uh, previous work uh, on, on this orientation. And in particular, something that's been called vertigo of direction. Um, which was very, very actively discussed in, uh, surprisingly, in nature in the 1880s, uh, and then uh, in Mind and, and his different journals, um, because a lot of the researchers, especially a lot of the researchers having done ethnographic research, uh, uh, came back with stories of having been turned around in their travels, and then Alfred Binet, uh, who was a psychologist based in Paris, started collecting reports of subjects who had been turned around to kind of characterize the phenomenon a bit better. And still, this is a fairly commonplace phenomenon. So that, like, every time I give a presentation about it, um, half of the room, or maybe the majority of the room, will have had a similar experience. Right? It's, it's not a very, it's not like an out-of-body experience that's uh, very rare. Um, so here's the way that it is explained in, in Alfred Minnett's uh, original paper. Uh, suppose you were in some place that you know perfectly well, such as your study or the street in which you live. Suppose that you shut your eyes for a second and that in this short interval, the external world about you turns round to the extent of two right angles on a vertical axis passing through your body so that an object previously in front of you should be behind you, another place on your right hand should have shifted to your left, and so on. Suppose that in this rotation, the external world should be displaced as a whole, and that the objects, notwithstanding their change of position in regard to you, should retain exactly their relations to one another. Lastly, suppose that during this strange revolution, you have no move, but that on the contrary, you have a firm conviction that you have been absolutely at rest. Now, open your eyes and look around you and fancy the feeling of bewilderment that all sees you. And you will have an idea of the impression I experienced when I was under the attack of what is called vertigo of direction. So the idea is that the experience is something like closing your eyes for a second and then the environment turning, uh, spinning around you 180 degrees. And uh, this is another report, right, of someone who is in Rue du Temple in Paris and goes into a shop, comes out, and wants to go to Place de la République. And instead of taking the right to return to Place de la République, I took the left to the Hotel de Ville. While on my way, I felt sure of meeting the Place de la République, such my confusion was extreme on coming to the Hotel de Ville. I was some moments in recognizing it. So this is the way it usually comes about that uh, one gets turned around. The idea is that one is on this street, Rue du Temps, between Hotel de Ville and Place de la République. Um, goes out onto the street, uh, the person thinks that they are going to the right, but they're actually going to the left. So when they're thinking that they're advancing towards Place de la République, and they're thinking that they're about to reach Place de la République, which is this, what they reach is this, which is Hotel de Ville, which is at the other side of town, right, at the other side of Paris. And instead of being in this vector, looking at Place de la République, there's a 180 degree switch looking at Hotel de Ville, right? And this results in the 180, in the illusion of orientation that comes first, and then in the rearrangement, that's the 180 degrees arrangement. Um, here's another report, then suddenly, at a given instant, I had the sensation of a sudden change of direction, 
or rather I had a clear sensation that the relation of the landscape to the direction of my movement had suddenly changed. I cannot better express the sensation which I felt than by the expression being turned around, which in French is renversement. renversement. It seemed to me that the landscape turned itself about. And I mean, the, the way this, this tends to happen to a lot of people, uh, which we've been collecting reports of disorientation, um, and when this spin turnaround happens to a lot of people, it's coming outside of the metro. Uh, there is a big street, and one, one exit of the metro faces in one direction of the street, the other faces in the opposite direction. Um, and they believe they are mistaken in what, in what uh, metro exit they are taking. When they come out onto the street, they for a second don't understand what they're looking at, and then they feel the environment switching around them 180. And here's another subject saying, my confusion was extreme and I found myself for some time in a state of complete disorientation and unable to comprehend the situation. All the objects and the streets occupy positions exactly opposite to those which they sold. Another says, here you know very well where you are. You have a very clear sense of direction and you know perfectly where things ought to be. Only this direction and this place are just the opposite of the real position. The station of Montparnasse, uh, Montparnasse uh, ought to be on the right, and I did not understand why I did not see it there. Um, so this is a particularly stubborn subject, I guess. So there are several aspects that I, I want to uh, discuss. One is that this, it seemed to me that the landscape turned itself about. And it's very curious to know what this seeming is. Uh, is. Is it a purely visual experience? Is the visual content, content turning around the way in real vertical one sometimes experiences the world really as spinning in a way? Like one can even see it shifting a bit um, or maybe some type of hallucination. Um, and it doesn't seem like the objects, you, one, one sees the objects physically move around oneself, but there is something still distinctly visual about the experience. It's not just a belief. Um, it's there is something, and, and it's not just bodily either. There, there seems to be something visual. It's very hard to put one's finger on what is the the turning of uh, aspect of the visual experience. Another one is that people found themselves in a state of complete disorientation. And the last one is this interesting that here you know very well where you are. So it's not that you are disoriented in the sense that you have no idea where you are. You're disoriented in the sense that you have a very clear sense of self-location, it's just off. Uh, it's just the wrong sense of self-location. So what is the relation between vertigo of direction, disorientation, and self-location? Now, I'll discuss uh, disorientation uh, for, for five, 10 minutes um, before ending the talk. So, the, the, what I want to, to defend here is that vertigo of direction is an instance of disorientation. It's a type of disorientation or a case of disorientation, uh, which as most of the subjects uh, describe feeling disoriented, uh, I think it's a, it's a fairly straightforward um, idea. But what is disorientation, right? So this doesn't really help us understand vertigo of direction unless we have a good understanding of disorientation already. And what we do at the disorientation group at Institut Janico, uh, one of the things we do is to collect reports of disoriented subjects. So we tell them to describe a disorienting experience that they've had, and then we collect some demographic data, and we have some uh, liquor scales uh, also about things like the experience made the environment feel unfamiliar, and then they uh, either strongly agree or strongly disagree, something in the middle. And we can use this uh, corpus of reports to do a thematic analysis, but we can also use the corpus of reports to kind of constrain our understanding of the phenomenon and thus to characterize the phenomenon. And the second way is uh, similar to the way that uh, philosophers sometimes use thought experiment. So, uh, although I think it's, it's, uh, there are some advantages to use like actual uh, reports. Um, so there is this thematic analysis and phenomenological analysis that I did of the reports uh, a year ago. Um, and what really comes to the fore are the affective elements of disorientation. 
such as anxiety, with people telling us, I didn't know where I was heading, nor to which side of the station I was going. The feeling is horrible and stressful, uh, vulnerability or helplessness. It made me feel vulnerable. I just felt confused and helpless. I didn't know what to do. Uh, confusion. I was slightly confused as all of the streets seemed similar and we kept walking in circle. Also, we took different turns. And a sense of diminishment or isolation, feeling almost like a re um, sense of the self diminishing. So I get nervous the longer it takes me to figure out the direction. I attempt to find out which street avenue I am at. It feels like I'm a tiny speck in all this action that's happening around me. So there is, as I said, there's a, um, in this paper, there is a more uh, precise phenomenological analysis of this, uh, and in which I, I look at the structure of the experience of disorientation. But it seems that the affective elements of it are very, very central, right? And something else that we can do with the corpus, as I said, is to constrain the characterization of disorientation. Something that we find is that there's actually an important distinction to be made between being lost and feeling disoriented. So there is something which it is being lost, which is, for example, believing that one is in a place that one is not and feeling disoriented, which is a very particular way of, uh, of feeling. And there is a double dissociation. So there is the paradigmatic disorientation case in which people feel disoriented and they are objectively lost. The paradigmatic orientation case in which people feel oriented and they are not lost objectively. Uh, they are objectively oriented, as it were. And then there is an illusory feeling of orientation, which is often the case. It's actually the case in the being turned around before the onset of the of the um, of the episode of being turned around, in that one believes uh, uh, to be going to Place de la République, but it is actually going to Hotel de Ville. So they are objectively lost, but they don't feel disoriented yet. And then there is very interesting an illusory feeling of disorientation. So some people who uh, believe, feel like they are lost and believe uh, because of the feeling that they are lost, but they are not actually lost. Um, they actually, if you ask them, where do you believe you are? They will answer and they will answer correctly. And sometimes it happens that they thought that the street was, was shorter and it turns out that it's longer. So they think that maybe they've lost the right turn, like they, they haven't taken the right turn. And we actually get quite a few of these, even though it sounds uh, perplexing that, that it exists. And still, even though there is a double dissociation, it seems that feeling disoriented should track being lost. Uh, whatever this feeling is, um, it really, for, for survival reasons, it should track being lost. So that if you are lost, it is very advantageous to feel disoriented. And also if you are feeling disoriented, uh, it is advantageous to actually be lost so that you actually, when you are doing the remediation actions uh, of uh, disorientation, um, that they make sense, that they only make sense if you're actually lost. So there seems to be a metacognitive element to, to the uh, feeling disoriented. So the question is, there is an affective element and a metacognitive element, uh, and this actually helps us answer what is disorientation. So the idea is that disorientation is a metacognitive feeling. Um, a metacognitive feeling, oh, there's a typo here, that evaluates and regulates active navigational processes, which is a claim um, uh, that uh, I argued for together with Roberto Casati in a couple of papers uh, last year. And metacognitive feelings are things like the feeling of familiarity or the feeling of error or the feeling of um, what's called the tip of the tongue state, when you are trying to answer a question and you feel that you have the answer on the tip of the tongue, but you cannot quite recall it. So in a way, there are feelings that are somehow a commentary on our cognitive uh, processes. Um, and in this sense, disorientation is, some, is similar to the feeling of confidence, right? In this case, it, it has to do with the confidence that we have on our active navigational process. And in, in layman terms, is disorientation is tracking how well we're doing at orienting. And when there are issues with navigational processes, disorientation emerges to, re to remedy the situation, right? Um, and certain behaviors follow that will help us um, 
reorient and that will also help us reduce the risk of being lost. So back to vertigo of direction, how does it help us to, to understand this orientation as a metacognitive feeling? So it's important to understand that vertigo of direction as a result of errors in the allocentric representations modulating visual experience. And in particular, in the integration of allocentric representations and egocentric representations, which is, part, which is what is happening in this modulation of visual experience. There is a modulation of visual experience, and if there are errors in that modulation, uh, it should be updated accordingly. But sometimes this doesn't happen, and this results in errors. So these errors eventually lead uh, to the emergence of disorientation. And when the errors are remedied because of disorientation, um, the 180 degree turn of allocentric representations results in the experience of the environment somehow turning around the subject. And the reason the experience is hard to put into words is because there's no physical object that is technically seen turning around. The reason is that what is turning around is the pattern of modulation of vision by allocentric representations. And this has the corresponding effect in visual experience. So the way that the allocentric representation modulates visual experience changes. There is a 180 degree uh, switch. And this switch uh, is what uh, results in the difference in visual experience. And something interesting is that degree of spatial modulation, which we had seen was already influenced by experience and by how active the navigation is, is itself regulated by metacognitive processes, such as um, the emergence of disorientation. Now, to understand more the, the account that I'm, uh, that I'm defending here, I think it's useful to look at the uh, environmental experience. Uh, and do a phenomenological analysis of environmental experience. I think an issue here is that very often um, we focus on very narrow examples, like I am in front of a door, and I do this myself when I'm explaining what self-location is. It's just the, the easiest uh, go-to example, I am in front of a door or a table or a window. And these examples sideline the richness of our ordinary visual experience because I'm rarely just in front of a door. I am always located in a particular meaningful place. Right now I'm located in my room, which I know is in a particular neighborhood of Oxford. I know where the garden is, I know where the river is. And I have this sense of where I am that's much richer than just being in front of a door or being in front of uh, whatever object. Um, and one way in which philosophers have actually already departed from this narrow focus is with regards to how bodily position modulates visual experience. Right, so here is Briscoe in a 2009 paper. Such body relative spatial information, which may be more or less precise, depending inter alia on the relevant effector, the object's distance in depth, and the visual structure of the object's background, and which may be more or less salient, depending inter alia on the specific task situation, the perceiver's expertise, and correlative demands on her attention, is part of the content of a visual experience of an object and is reflected in its phenomenology. Thus, as Peacock observes, the experience of seeing Buckingham Palace while looking straight ahead is not the same as the experience of seeing the palace with one's face turned towards it, but with one's body turned to the right. So the idea is if we are looking at Buckingham Palace, um, it is very different to look straight ahead at Buckingham Palace or to look with our bodies 90 degrees to the right and then turn our head and look at Buckingham Palace. It's actually a different visual experience. And I think this is very similar to the way that allocentric representations modulate visual experience. It is not the same visual experience to face Hotel de Ville before and after being turned around. Just as seeing Buckingham Palace while looking straight ahead is not the same as the experience of seeing the palace with one's face turned toward it, but with one's body turned to the right. So just like bodily position, an allocentric representation becomes part of the content of a visual experience of an object and is reflected in its phenomenology. And here we look at a Husserlian concept, which is called uh, the horizon of intentionality or the horizon of experience. 
and Husserl indicates that our experiences happen within a horizon of intentionality, an implicit context in which the objects of our experience are intertwined. This includes not only inner horizons, like the yet unseen but anticipated sides of an object, but also outer horizons, involving a larger still underdetermined context surrounding the objects of our experience. So if before we were looking straight ahead at uh, the golden statue of Buckingham Palace, and we have the, the front of the palace to our left, we have a sense of where we are. We have a sense of where the palace is, even if it's not the direct object of our perceptual experience, the immediate object of our perceptual experience. And this is because the sense of where we are is part of this horizon of uh, intentionality or horizon of, of experience is part of this larger, still underdetermined context surrounding the objects of our experience. Horizons are made up of other possibilities of perception as perceptions that we could have if we actively directed the course of perception otherwise. If, for example, we turn our eyes that way instead of this, or if we were to step forward or to one side and so forth. So a lot of people, when talking about horizons of intentionality, they talk about the backside of objects. There is a, we have a sense of, uh, in our perceptual experience, of the backside of objects, and um, this has to do with possibilities for action or possibilities for perception also, that if we went around the object, we'll see the back of the object. And we have a certain anticipation of what that back will look, and this influences our uh, perception of the object. But when we look at the original Husserl, it's not just the back of the object, but it's, so it's not only looking around objects, but also looking around ourselves. So looking around to the environment where we are. Um, and this possibility of perception is also important for understanding the horizon of intentionality. So it's important that these possibilities for perception are not fully determined, but their possibilities are constrained. So if I'm looking at Buckingham Palace, I don't know exactly what I will see when I turn around, but I will not expect to turn around and find myself in Paris. There's a certain underdetermined representation of the space around me, but there's also a certain degree of anticipation and a certain sense in which the possibilities of perception are constrained. So here is a recent paper by Jorba. Uh, I think it's quite helpful in, in uh, examining this question of the horizon is what exactly is constraining the possibilities of the horizon, the context of the perception. If I'm in front of my desk table in my office at the university, the elements of the context also constrain the kind of possibilities that are left open for my perception. So that perceiving a mountain inside the room is clearly an empty possibility, as is perceiving Paris when we turn around if we are facing back in Hampalas. So the idea is that the allocentric representations of the place in which one is, in the quote above my office at the university, are part of the horizon of intentionality of the visual experience of that place. When I look at Buckingham Palace, the place that it is becomes part of the content of my visual experience. What is more, phenomenologically speaking, this horizon is what makes visual experience self-locating at face value because horizons play a constitutive role making experience with its conceptual dimensions and justificatory potential possible. So I think this is how it goes. It goes from allocentric representations, uh, which are coded in, in the hippocampus, and from this hippocampal activity down to visual processes. And this is the way this is uh, reflected in our phenomenology. Um, so as a conclusion, Visual experience is self-locating in virtue of cognitive maps that modulate visual processing in a top-down fashion. Visual experience is self-locating because self-location precedes visual experience, which of course updates self-location in a feedback loop. It's not some kind of magical uh, map that just happens to be right. Of course, the visual signals and the visual input uh, in turn updates our both our allocentric representations of the space and the integration of egocentric and allocentric representations that will then modulate uh, visual processing. But it's not just visual input that will, um, that will update self-location. A big part of this is uh, self-motion cues also.
And this spatial modulation is reflected in the phenomenology of environmental experience. And which is what we just saw looking at the horizon of intentionality. And finally, the degree of spatial modulation varies and is itself regulated by metacognitive processes, as is made clear in the case of disorientation. <laughs>